throughout the week, I've been listening to various news agencies across Britain. And you know what they're all talking about? Specifically, Israel. And it's interesting because some of these radio programs, people call in and give their opinion, their opinion, their opinion. And the BBC, for one, and I'm not sure I have a lot of faith still in the BBC for whatever reasons and various reasons. But LBC, LBC is probably, it's the London Broadcasting Corporation, I guess, what it is. They've been around a long time, but they yeah, are radio. independent radio out of London. And they would be considered not as bad as, but similar to Fox. The alt alternate view of things. <laughs> and everybody is, you know, looking in and, and whining and, oh, you know... And what, what struck me about one of the opinions that seemed to be gathering speed was that someone needs to be the first to say, well, we're not going to retaliate. And I thought to myself, yeah, well, good luck with that. Because... Yeah, it never stops. It 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 goes We've on. Been yeah. Well, it's been going on for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it it has. And that's why they exist. This is their claimed version of why we exist. But to just expect evil to not do something evil is a pipe dream. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, so Jesus said, and he said, listen, if somebody, don't resist, don't give evil for evil, somebody slaps you on the one cheek, yeah. offer the other. Yeah. Okay, so this is the epitome of, of not retaliating. And in the life of Jesus, he, he never physically retaliated. Now, spiritually, those pigs didn't fare well because of the demons that didn't fare well. But the devil is never going to say, well, all right, let's just call a truce. It's never going to happen. It doesn't matter what our view of this fight between light, light and dark. Darkness is always trying to put out the light. Aggressively, yeah. It's like, why are you so, why, what is it? Why don't you go pick on the Buddhists? Why don't you go pick on the Eskimos? Is that even a right term anymore? The Inuits. Okay. Why don't you go, no, it's got to be Israel at the moment. Right. And, and in the end, because Christians keep on talking about, can we say it, the Old Testament, and all those laws and all those commandments, because they won't shut up about that, he's going to try and shut them up. But it's never going to happen. He's never going to be successful. And I thought... What is the problem here? What is going on? And here's where we'll go this morning. I entitled this Jerusalem. And our scripture, beginning in, uh, in Psalm 132, verse 13, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever, he says. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And from time to time, I've heard fellow Christians, interestingly, only ever Christians, not heathen, who have become convinced that Israel is of no longer 
any interest to God. All of these troubles throughout history, they say, have come upon Israel as judgments from God. And the verse before the verse you read right there, verse 12, says, if, if, there's a, there's a qualifier, but it's not the qualifier that we might think. This is a statement of fact verse. This is what I want, and this is why I want, okay? You have to separate the people from the place. The place existed before the people. God chose the place. Then he put his people there. Right? How they behaved had nothing to do with how God felt about the place. So just go back and read that verse in plain English. And it reads, Psalm 132, verse 12. Here's the if part. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. And here's the part where God says, Why? For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell for I have desired it. This is his place. For whatever reason, this is the place. God is no longer interested in Israel, they say, because, A, the Israelites turned their backs on God one too many times. B, they killed the prophets whom God sent to them. C, they offered up his son, Jesus, to be crucified. D. And finally, as the last straw, the Israelites stoned Stephen. And all of this at the behest and with the approval of the religious element in Israel. And I feel like we can say there's no argument there. They did do all these things. They were a stiff-necked people. The history of their rebelliousness begins the moment they walked out of Egypt. You know, the history of their rebelliousness. I mean, there's a lot of unwritten history that we are not privy to, that they behaved this way. Even Moses was a murderer, for heaven's sake, before they ever left Egypt. You'll remember the Romans were not interested in taking the life of Jesus. It wasn't Pilate or any other governor who sent out the order to have all the children murdered. It was Herod, the king, the Jew, with the Jewish mother, raised as a Jew. The Roman centurion, the owner of the servant, came to Jesus seeking healing for that servant. And it was yet another centurion at the foot of the cross who recognized who Jesus was. Yeah. While everybody else is saying, ah, saved others, let him save himself. There was something about this parcel of land in the Middle East that God decided was going to be ground zero for where he was going to put a pin in history. And just as in a similar fashion, maybe never thought about this, the works of William Shakespeare have been partly, if not largely, responsible for keeping alive the language of the King James Version of the Bible. The Hebrew language of the Israelites has kept alive all of the old Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible. The Hebrew language is the only living Canaanite language that is still in use at present. The earliest Hebrew writings that have been discovered date back to 3,000 years ago. 
BC. 5,000, 3,000 years BC. Does that add up? Whatever, they're old. <laughs> right? 3,000 I can't remember what I wrote down there now. See, the 3,000 BC, no, it had to be more than, it had to be 3,000 years BC. But somewhere between 200 and 400 BC, people stopped using Hebrew as their spoken language, and eventually it started dying. But in the 19th century, with the rise of Zionism, it's the 1800s, you'll have to look that up later, Zionism, Hebrew went through a revival process and once again started being used as a modern spoken language. At present, Hebrew is the official language of Israel with five million native speakers. Wow. When the Ark of the Covenant is once again unearthed and those tables are lifted out, there will be no need for artificial intelligence to translate them. You've been keeping up with the news. There are people alive today who will be able to read what God wrote with his own finger. It's going to be something to see, isn't it? <laughs> On both sides of those tablets. And you can guarantee this ark containing those tablets is not going to turn up in a cabinet in New York City or in a drawer in Washington, D.C. This ark is going to be found in Israel. Probably not far from Jerusalem, where they started out, or where they left from. Okay, Not far from the Temple Mount. Not far from where Isaac would have been offered up as a sacrifice. Not far from where Jesus was offered up. Not far from where Jesus ascended to heaven and where the angels who stood with those watchers said he would return just like this. Right? What are you looking at? Oh, he's coming back. Just like he left. He left. Yeah. And at the end, or should we say the beginning, of all things, the New Jerusalem, I mean, just look at the name, New Jerusalem, comes where? To Jerusalem. <laughs> the great controversy records it this way. This is priceless. Christ descends upon the Mount of Olives. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Whence, after his resurrection, he ascended, and where angels repeated the promise of his return. Says the prophet, The Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east. Oh, east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, and there shall be a very great valley, as the new Jerusalem in its dazzling splendor comes down out of heaven, it rests upon the place purified and made ready to receive it. And Christ, with his people and the angels, enters the holy city. That's from the Great Controversy, pages 662 and 663. <laughs> if you want to make an argument for God stepping back from the Israelites, you could probably build a case for that, but not the place. Israel, specifically Jerusalem, is where the end begins and the world ends. Charles had a seminar by that title, which I sent out during the week. I've been watching it. It's going along with what you're preaching. I know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. God has a long history with Israel. He moved out the Canaanites, former owners of what came to be known as Israel. Then came the Philistines, who occupied an area on the Mediterranean Sea in the west of Israel, part of which is now known as the Gaza Strip. 
just southwest of Jerusalem. After Samson's victories and disastrous brush with the Philistines due to his loving wife Delilah, Samson brought down their temple, you'll remember. Later on, a young Jewish shepherd boy named David, following the instructions of his father, went with bread and cheeses to feed and get news of his brothers who were in a standoff with the Philistines. While he's there, he listens to the ranting of this giant of a man named Goliath. Indignant, David offers to take on the beast. Now, what goes through King Saul's mind when he clothes David with his armor is not really clear to the, to the rational mind. But David gives the armor back. You remember, he didn't trust it. Probably too big anyway. David is, after all, to the eye of appearance, a lowly, unmuscled shepherd. He approaches the beast-like man with nothing more, to the eye of appearance, than a sling made with leather, skin, and a stone. A stone, according to the record, from out of the brook, a stone cut out without hands, just tumbled down the street, smooth, the record says, smooth. David approaches the cursing Goliath and announces that he is there in the name of the Lord and says these interesting words to Goliath recorded in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 47. All this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Notice, our hands. He identifies himself with the army of Israel, even though he's just a lowly shepherd boy visiting. Much to the brother's dismay, if you will remember, what are you doing here? Get out. Go. And with the giant's own sword, David cuts off the head of the beast <laughs> and carries that head back to Jerusalem in a bag. Such a big story right there in chapter 17. Talk about a story with multiple meanings. David, the shepherd from Bethlehem, moves into the palace. David goes through periods of victories and persecutions. David eventually becomes king of all Israel and makes his home in Jerusalem. David draws up plans for the first temple and its furniture in Jerusalem. Though he doesn't have it built, his son, Solomon, sees to the construction. David, though, purchases, purchases Ornan's threshing floor for 600 shekels of gold. Now, in today's economy, that's a little less than $5,000. The gold would probably be worth more. But in today's economy, it would, that's what it would be worth, would have been worth. Ornan offers for nothing this place where David builds an altar to sacrifice to the Lord. But nevertheless, David pays for it. And this becomes the place where the first temple is built to the glory of God. No, that was the same place that God offered up Isaac. Th that, that, I'm not sure we can prove it, but yes, that is makes sense. That's what said. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, no, he, there's, there's no reason for us to believe that that is incorrect. Why not? I mean, it make perfect sense. That's why Abraham, yeah, I mean, he, there was something about this that he wanted this especially. David wanted this especially. And Abraham was told to go, take the boy and go to, and he went to, and, and it wasn't over there and it wasn't over there that this ram is caught in the thicket. It's right there. And God indeed provides for himself 
a sacrifice. <laughs> the, the bigness of all of this. It's a lot deeper than that. It is, and and this, is, this is just what we think we know, too. And, you know, at some point when we get to sit down with God, with Jesus, with the Spirit, however this instruction, however this class is going to go, we're going to say, oh, wow, oh, you know, this is what this means and this is what that meant and this, this, this. But here, this is important to David and he buys this place. And by all accounts, this spot will become the final resting place for the final temple. In the language of the Bible, in the New Jerusalem, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of the New Jerusalem. It's not a building. This is, there's something very spiritual, some big spiritual meaning going on here. And someone out beyond the camera is going to say, I know what that is. And it's brilliant. You know, we're still sorting all of this out. But let's say it again. Israel, and specifically Jerusalem, appears to be of great importance to God. And let's consider the new Jerusalem in proportion to the old Jerusalem. Old Jerusalem, in size, is 49 square miles. <laughs> it's not very big. The New Jerusalem, recorded in Revelation 21.16, reads, now we have to do some calculations here, the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now we're supposing here for a moment that the measurement is 12,000 furlongs on all four sides. But it might not be. But let's do 12, well, let's suppose here, okay? 12,000 furlongs equals 1,500 miles. Whoa, really? Per side. If we take those 15, 15, okay, each side. So how many square? Well, let's see. If that is in fact the case, then the floor space of this city is more than 2 million square miles. What? So, whoa. That's big. Did you figure that out? I did. I figured it out with a calculator. Oh, no. But let's say the it's angel. Square miles. I know. It'd be big. <laughs> okay, it's, it's big. All right. Now let's say the angel measured all four sides and they totaled 12,000 furlongs. Okay, let's just say that. That would be 3,000 furlongs per side. Okay. Which would equal 375 miles per side. In square miles, that would be 140,625 square miles. I mean, even that, you know, it's like... 144,000 miles. Well, there's a lot of people. Yeah, but it, you know, it's, always, it's only 6,000 miles from here to California. How many people have been on this earth for all these years? I know, that's all earth, then. That's all earth. I think we can safely say that this new city would totally encompass old Jerusalem with its 49 square miles. Oh, yeah. And much of the region beyond Jerusalem. I don't know about those measurements. Well, I'll tell you what. I guess we you can just, just get, get, your cal get your calculator out. I know. It's like, that. doesn't that seem unnecessary? It, I mean, is there any limit to God? It's like, oh, that's big enough. So we read that the holy city is to descend on the Mount of Olives. Well, that's not Jerusalem. Well, why isn't that Jerusalem? We could split hairs here, but the Mount of Olives is less than three quarters of a mile from Jerusalem. That's like from here to my house. 
Okay, so this this city, even if if we take the biggest menu uh, measurement or the smallest measurement, it's going to be it's huge. Okay. Interestingly, though, even the small smallest dimensions, the New Jerusalem, using those smallest dimensions, the New Jerusalem is going to cover entirely, totally. The entire land of Israel, and then some. So, what are we to make of this latest development in the Middle East? Is this just a war and a rumor of war, or what? Human beings tire of war in the news. In fact, we tire of war until it arrives at the gas pump, and then all of a sudden that war gets interesting. Yeah. And speaking of interesting, unrest in the Middle East usually pushes gas prices up. But yeah, what's that? Oh, it's only Israel. Let's not be too concerned, right? But the oil doesn't necessarily come from Israel, but it comes from everything around there. Yeah, it's almost like I don't know about you. If you've been watching the gas prices, they haven't been going up; they've been coming they down. down. Like, what in the world? You know, usually hurricane goes through the Gulf, gas prices go up. Somebody sneezes in the Middle East, gas prices go up. War in Ukraine, gas prices go up. War in Israel. <laughs> They haven't stopped Iran from selling it to Russia, so whatever. There's about to be a mess over there, okay? Not and and it, and it may just be just the latest mess. Well, this well, may not be the end of the world. This is a really big mess, but the, it could be. It could come. You know, it could. The Lord could put His hands on it and give us more time. He could, but, it could be but the end. for what? Could yeah. All of the parts and pieces have to be in place. You ever played chess? A little bit. Okay, you've got all of these pieces, 16 pieces each. And that's human, a human game, 16 pieces each. Now, all of those pieces have to be in the right place for there to be checkmate. If if one part is not in the right place, then the king can just move himself. He can just get out of trouble or something can get in the way to block the influence of that piece. Now, I'm not going to say that the game of chess is an inspired invention, but, oh my goodness, to not see that God is a master chess player who knows every move that can be made. I mean, in terms of inventing the world, he invented the world. He knows how the devil thinks, unfortunately. Unfortunately, so do we sometimes know how the devil thinks. But we don't know the moves, really, that he makes, or is able to make. The end. I, if the devil does. I don't think he does. I think he knows there's going to be an end. But I don't, I don't get the idea that he knows how this is actually going to play out, other than reading the book of Revelation. You know, here we've got thousands of Christian denominations who are all reading the same Bible and are all interpreting pieces of it just a little bit different. Now, the devil knows the book in the original languages. He knows, he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. But he doesn't have the spirit to have the interpretation of what these things mean. So he can look at the book of Revelation and see the mark of the beast and see this and this. 
And he may not know exactly what all of this means. And the best chess players have everything in place except for that one piece that's just sitting over here. Now we're looking at that from a godly perspective, okay? Here's the board, all the parts and pieces are in place. And there's this one piece, a really insignificant piece. Jesus might have referred to that, of the stone that the builders rejected. The one, oh, this one yeah. made all the difference. This one piece makes one single move and finishes the game. And it's all over. There is no going anywhere. So does the devil know? I think he will have to figure out what to do as the scroll unrolls himself because even though he may know the words yeah he knows the words but he doesn't know what they mean it's like a lot of us we know all the words but we really don't know what they mean you know the devil has to sit in the place of God yeah, that that's that's what he wants. That that is his intention. And doesn't he go by some of the? He looks at what how you're doing. He he goes by your reactions to add to his playbook of what. Yeah, he is a master psychologist. He has studied humanity for these six thousand plus years, yes. and knows. I mean, gracious, he got the victory. <clears throat> with one simple sentence in the garden. I mean, this, this foe is not to be underestimated. But at the same time, by the same token, God is not to be underestimated either. More so. God uses people and uses nations. Yeah, he does. If he can. If he can. Yeah, to push all the pieces in place, quietly, if they're willing. Sometimes if they're not, <laughs> sad to say, you know, he, 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 we, we're so much of a mess that we are tools in God's hands without even realizing it sometimes, you know. But it would be interesting to know the whole story, wouldn't it? The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Who said what? Who did what? And honestly, I'm not sure what to make of all of this, to be honest. Yeah. <sighs> Except to say that if God had completely abandoned the, the Israelites and all these historical troubles were judgments come from God, then shouldn't we have expected God through the Nazis to have won the war? That's a good theory, yes. I'm just thinking that. Why would God strengthen us, the allies, to defeat a tool in his own hand. And you don't know Winston Churchill's heart, but if you read the history of that, God was certainly with that man. Absolutely. So, you know, and... Even though he didn't seem like he was a godly man, but he was, but he was in many ways. You don't have to be your... Yeah, I mean, English people can be godly in a sense that doesn't look like they're being godly. Yeah. English people are funny animals. <laughs> well, we all are. Besides that, America is the melting pot, so. <laughs> you know, we talked about C.S. Lewis two, three weeks back, who converted from atheism to Christianity. And as powerful as he was in the hands of atheists, he became more powerful in the hands of Christians. So much so that we're, we're reading his things still today and still being inspired by these things today. And, you know, it, it doesn't... Sometimes it just looks like God is not winning. I mean... You take a look at the cross. Did it look like God was winning? Not to the eye of appearance, it didn't, did it? But have you noticed how quiet the devil went after that event?
the demons, where'd they go? To her. But they were very, very quiet. And what after? What again? After the cross. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, how, what? It looked to the eye of appearance. There was persecution, but there's no devils springing up saying, frothing at the mouth, the boy that this, and there's no, there's nothing recorded. Um, there's no temptations in the wilderness. What we see is, like they were saying this morning, what we see is a tool in the hand of the devil being snatched out of the hand of the devil. And Jesus comes down and talks to this man, Saul, Paul, and says, you know, time for a change. And like, he, like they were saying, imagine Stephen and Saul, Paul, meeting in heaven. He's the one who held your coat. Yeah, how did you get here? And he wrote most of the New Testament. Oh, man. Now, we really don't think we'll have long to wait to see where all this is going. And maybe we'll be out of here sooner than we think. Time will tell, like you said. Now, I'm not sure that's a terribly good closing thought. <laughs> but we'll end for there right now, okay? We'll say amen to that. <laughs> so much more we could say on that and so much, so, so much further. as Charles saw it and I think it's pretty accurate you know you have to have the, the West which could be Israel the, the West coming against Iran in a big way and that could happen now but it could be put on too Charles's view of that ram was that the ram was Islam and that the two horns on the ram were Iraq, and Iran. Were, were Iraq and Iran. Now, that is easy to see because they're probably, you know, two of the most dominant characters in the Middle East. So, Iran is just such a mess. It's got to be broken. Yeah, they're, 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 no, no. Still kicking. Still kicking. And it's re it, it is responsible for all these terrorist groups. It's supplying the means for them. Yeah, yeah some of them anyway, yeah, for know. sure. And they know that. They see the money. But um, that prophecy in Daniel was given while Babylon still existed as a city still being inhabited and a lot of these things made very little sense at the time they make more sense now than they did back then you know the angel is talking to daniel in sanctuary language when in jerusalem the sanctuary was just a pile of rubble so Daniel was in Babylon. Yeah, but he was prophesying. Right. So these things made very little sense back then. You wonder what might have gone through Daniel's mind. What's he talking about? Yeah, well, he didn't really know, did he? He couldn't have known because it just yeah, course, made no sense. Has, has, it builds on that, but not in the same, not in the same exact words. Yeah. But they do go together. They do. It is, it is, and, and some pieces on the board are not in place at the moment, which is probably why we can't understand a lot of the things. We've had a lot of things that, you know, but they're coming. It's going to happen and it didn't happen, or something yeah. else happens and we're really shocked. They're coming, you know, in, in the days of John and the book of Revelation. You have to wonder what went through his mind when he's talking about a mark of the beast beast animal it was an animal as far as he was concerned a mark no buying no selling except everybody had that so from his perspective all the parts and pieces weren't in place and they're not all in place today otherwise we would have 
the mark of the beast, which we don't have so it takes right now. It takes time to get all the pieces in place on the board. And, and God is never late, <laughs> rarely early. Just on time. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take us from this place, bless us with the rest that only you can give, the peace that is only yours to give. And Lord, as, as things unfold in this world, we pray that you would give us a wisdom to know where we are in the prophetic timeline, where we are in the timeline of the world, what the signposts are, what they mean. We pray that you'd help us open our Bible and study with, with discernment, with the Spirit, your Spirit, that only can give us the true meaning of these things. Bless us, take us from this place till we all see each other again. I pray that you would keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.